Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Clough, who is Professor of Theological Ethics at the University of Chester in the United Kingdom. Dr. Clough's first book, Ethics in Crisis, Interpreting Barth's Ethics, was a powerful intervention in Barth's studies. And there quickly followed an important co-written work on the ethics of war. The first volume of Dr. Clough's On Animals, which engaged systematic issues, was published in 2012. The second and succeeding volume on theological ethics will, I believe, be published later this year. In his research and teaching, and as president of the UK Society for the Study of Christian Ethics, and as co-chair of the Animals and Religion Group at the AAR, and as a Methodist lay preacher, Dr. Clough is a trailblazer in pressing and helping Christians to think about the place of animals in God's creation, and in promoting an ethic of care and justice for creatures. He's a scholar of deep learning and passion, and he will speak today on the topic of using Bart, quote, to justify doing nothing. James Cohn's unanswered critique of Bart studies 50 years on. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Clough to the podium. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation uh, to you, and uh, uh, thanks to Kate, and thanks to the center. Um, I apologize for, the, uh, for those of you who hadn't been notified about that change of title. Um, and I uh, hadn't seen Paul's paper before he delivered it, uh, but I'm glad and um, unapologetic about the common ground between uh, our two papers. It was two months ago yesterday that James H. Cohn died. It was 50 years ago this summer that he sat down to write Black Theology and Black Power in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., angry at white ministers who, condemn, con, who condemned black violence in the riots that followed in major US cities while remaining silent about the white violence inflicted on black people. Later that summer, the Conference of Latin American Bishops met in Midland, Colombia, and adopted the preferential option for the poor. Karl Barth died that December. In 1968, having completed a PhD on Barth, Cohn was angry with European and North American Barthian theologians in particular, quote, who used him to justify doing nothing about the struggle for justice and, quote, confused white talk with God talk. Fifty years on, I note that very few white scholars of Bart have engaged with Cohn's critique. Cohn later described his project, project as a black theology of liberation, but was deeply critical about the comparative reception of liberation theology and black theology by white male theologians, complaining that white male North American theologians preferred to talk about solidarity with the poor of Latin America than their black neighbors back home. This seems a crucial word to hear as we take up the topic of Bart and liberation theology at Princeton. A final point of context for this paper is the challenge issued by the black British theologian Robert Beckford, who points out that the vast majority of white British theologians have failed to take seriously the imperial context of British theology, and as a result, quote, white theology in Britain has not decolonized itself and is therefore still very much anti-black. We might note Professor Nigel Bigger's Ethics and Empire project at the University of Oxford as a conspicuous current case in point. Nigel Bigger is no stranger to Bart studies, is a previous speaker at this conference, and his teaching was influential on my choice of Bart's ethics as a topic for my PhD. Beckford calls for white British theologians, quote, to produce exorcised white theologies that have the categories of thought and action to embrace their black and brown brothers and sisters and strive to a new inclusive British Christian theology and church life. I count myself among the white British theologians who need urgently to respond to Beckford's call. 
This constellation of points of context for my contribution to this conference convinced me that it would be irresponsible to fail to attend to Cohn's critique of the white reception of black theology, especially among Bartians, as part of attending to the relationship between Bart and liberation theology. My aim is to rehearse and digest the implications of Cohn's critique for the conference project of considering how the work of Bart may be brought to bear on the future of liberation theology, as well as offering a short worked example of taking a critical theology of race seriously for Bart studies at the intersection of Bart, race, and animals. So first section, Cohn on Bart and Bartians. The relationship between James Cohn and Karl Barth starts with a particularly acute irony. He reported being put off by studying Christian ethics by the fact that the professor of Christian ethics was one of the most blatantly racist professors at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Garrett had never had a black PhD student, and the professor told Cohn not to apply because they had their pick of straight A white students from Yale and Harvard, which turned out to be a lie. Cohn found William Horden, who taught systematic theology, much more supportive but decided that he would not get a PhD from Garrett if he wrote on theology and race. His choice to focus on Bart for his dissertation was therefore a defensive move in the context of a racist academy. He was later criticized by black theologians, including his brother, for an overdependence on Bart and other white European theologians in his early work, which he conceded and responded to by drawing increasingly on black authors and church traditions. There were also positive reasons for Cohn's choice of Bart. He recognized common ground between Bart's theological approach and the black church experience. Cohn saw in Bart an example of how to relate theology to life, valued Bart's starting point with Jesus and his emphasis on the word of God in scripture and preaching. He felt a spiritual kinship with Bart, especially the Bart of the epistle to the Romans, and took inspiration from the way Bart was prepared to challenge received norms. Quote, I purposely intended to be provocative in much the same way that Bart was when he rebelled against liberal theology. Most of Cohn's critiques of Bartian thought are not of Bart himself, but of the use Bartians made of him. Quote, I was angry not with Bart, but only with European and North American Bartians who used him to justify doing nothing about the struggle for justice. I've always thought that Bart was closer to me than to them, but whether I was right or wrong about where Bart would stand on the matter, the truth was that I was no longer going to allow privileged white theologians to tell me how to do theology. Cohn was disappointed by the lack of response to black theology and black power from white theologians, commenting in 2010 that, quote, not many white theologians accepted my challenge to them to speak. They just kept writing about their favorite academic themes as America's cities burned. They are still silent or only make marginal reference to the role of white supremacy in America and its theology. His analysis of this white silence was clear and direct. Quote, because white theologians live in a society that is racist, the oppression of black people does not occupy an important item on their theological agenda. Again, as Karl Marx put it, quote, it is not consciousness that determines life, but life de that determines consciousness. Uh, unquote of Cohn quoting Bart. Because white theologians are well fed and speak for a people who control the means of production, the problem of hunger is not a theological issue for them. That is why they spend more time describing the relation between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith than probing the depths of Jesus' command to feed the poor. Cohn points out that being descendants of slave masters rather than slaves, or I might add in my own British context, the heirs of those who accumulated wealth through the trade in slaves, affects the mental grid of theologians. Quote, not only what books they read when doing their research, but also which aspects of personal experience will shape theological style and methodology. This problem is amplified when white theologians, quote, claim objectivity for their theological discourse. Cohn stated on the Black Theology of Liberation in 1970 that American theology is racist in that it identifies theology as dispassionate analysis of the tradition, unrelated to the sufferings of the oppressed. 20 years on, in Risks of Faith, he asked, is racism so deeply embedded in Euro-American Euro history and culture that it is impossible to do theology without being anti-black? In the same work, 
he complained that despite the blatant use of Christianity to justify slavery, colonialism, and segregation for nearly 500 years, white theologians in the seminaries, university departments of religion and divinity schools, and professional societies refused to acknowledge white supremacy as a theological problem and continued their business as usual, as if the lived experience of blacks was theologically vacuous. Cohn commented, their silence on race is so conspicuous that I sometimes wonder why they are not greatly embarrassed by it. And, as I noted in my opening remarks, Cohn criticized the hypocrisy of white North American theologians expressing solidarity with the poor of Latin America while ignoring their black near neighbors. Quote, it was not until Orbis books published the translated works of Latin American liberation theologians that white North American male theologians cautiously began to talk and write about liberation theology and God's solidarity with the poor. But they still ignored the black poor in the United States, Africa, and Latin America. Our struggle to make sense out of the fight for racial justice was dismissed as too narrow and divisive. White US theologians used the Latin American focus on class to minimize and even dismiss the black focus on race. African Americans wondered how US whites could take sides with the poor out there in Latin America without first siding with the poor here in North America. It was as if they had forgotten about their own complicity in the suffering of the black poor, who often were only a stone's throw from the seminaries and universities where they taught theology. Section two, responding to Cohn's critique. I hope that it is clear that the problem is not just in the past. The role of Christian voters in electing Donald Trump as US president and enabling, among other atrocities, the current tearing of children from Latinx parents at the Mexican border to be placed in cages is but one indicator of the enduring relevance of Cohn's critique. Some of you may have seen on the news or in your social media feeds and, uh, or, have, or heard the cries of caged children yesterday that were broadcast. We need to acknowledge many factors in understanding the remarkable phenomenon of how Trump came to occupy the White House, of course, but among them we must number the association between white churches and white supremacy. The problem is also still closer to home. Follow the Seminary While Black hashtag on Facebook or Twitter for first-hand accounts of what it's like to be a black seminarian in the US today. Ali Henney's post earlier this month noted that James Cone appeared on just three pages in the systematic theology textbook used in four of her MDiv modules at Fuller. She observes that this is the same number of refer references to Bark as in JS, whereas there are 40 references to Bart as in Carl. Cone's concern that white American theologians prioritize European theologians like Bart over theologies attentive to those disadvantaged in the US context, such as black and womanist theologies, is obviously still relevant 50 years on. It seems to me that white scholars of Bart studies in North America and other contexts such as mine, where racism remains powerfully operative within theology and beyond, that we have a particular responsibility to reflect on the unexamined whiteness of our discipline. In my reading in preparation for this paper, I found a range of thoughtful engagements with Cohn's critique of Bart and its legacy from black theologians. Josiah Young, Beverly Mitchell, Raymond Carr, Vincent Lloyd, J. Cameron Carter, Willie Jennings, among others. These accounts are an interesting disagreement about the implications of Bart and Cohn for theological accounts of race today. But I found only two white theologians who discuss Cohn's critique of Bart even briefly. Stephen D. Long, Paul Daffith Jones, uh, uh, and then uh, last night in the bar, I learned about uh, Theo uh, Whitleavitt, who Tyler Davis and Rye Sigal Cow pointed me to, uh, and do go to their paper this afternoon if you want to hear more. I'm sure my literature search is incomplete, but I'm equally sure that the necessary supplement will not demonstrate that white theologians have given sufficient time to digesting and responding to the challenge Cone presents. I recognize the discomfort of being a white male theologian attempting to engage issues of race and whiteness. In giving this paper, I'm uncomfortably aware of speaking from a position of guilt in relation to my complicity in perpetuating systems of white male privilege, both as a British citizen and a professional theologian that operate to my benefit. This is accompanied by an acute sense of an indefensible belatedness in addressing the issue of race now which has never before been the focus of my academic work and the consequent embarrassment in publicly acknowledging this inadequacy. 
My theological education at Oxford, Cambridge, and Yale not only failed to address issues of race, but also left me with prejudices about theological methodology that meant I thought I had grounded theological reasons for being inattentive to the work of contextual theologians. Finally, I'm aware of raising this topic from a position of incompetence, both because white people are in a position of epistemological disadvantage in reflecting critically about race and because I'm only just beginning to get to grips with literature in this area. So I recognize that I'm likely to be raising this issue in inexpertly, ignorantly, and clumsily. But I am persevering in raising the issue of the problematic whiteness of Bart's studies despite this discomfort, because it now seems to me that it is academically, theologically, and morally indefensible for me to fail to do so. I've been helped to this realization by reading and hearing the scholarship of Robert Beckford and Anthony Reddy in the UK, and Valerie Cooper, Emily Towns, Willie Jennings, and J. Cameron Carter in the US, among others. But I've also been helped to see things differently by the conversation I had at AAR a few years back with a young black male US pastor who was completing a PhD, but considering leaving the US because in the neighborhoods where he felt called to pastor, the risk of being killed by police, even while wearing a clerical collar, was becoming too great for him and his family to tolerate. And I was helped by another recent conversation I had at AR with a young black female prospective PhD student who had been told that womanist ethics were not an appropriate topic for doctoral study, which has echoes of Cohn's experience 50 years ago and by a challenge brought to last year's Animals and Religion session at AR by Gianna Ray Moore, who challenged the whiteness of the group's preoccupations, in response to which Chris Carter has pulled together a wonderful panel on race and animals for this year's conference to which she and Willie Jennings will contribute, among others. I'm grateful for the help I've received from all of these quarters to recognize the need to do my theology differently. I recently participated as an external representative on a PhD review of a young white male North American student. He wanted to write a project at the interface between theology and politics. He presented to me and the white male internal reviewer a project outline in which he would look at the work of two white male theologians on the topics of money, sex, and power. Why those ethical topics, I asked when there are so many others pressing, such as Black Lives Matter, immigration, wealth inequality, famine, gender relations, ecological crisis. He replied that he had picked the topics because they were important in the work of both of the authors he had identified. And why those authors? The answer was that they seemed to be recognized as important in the discipline. I suddenly had a dizzying sense of the conservative mechanics of the reproduction of the theological academy the inevitably blinkered preoccupations of one generation setting the agenda for the next, canonizing, valorizing, and perpetuating a strange subset of interest with very little relation to what issues in our world are in need of theological attention. I happen to agree with Cohn's statement that Bart was more on his side than on the side of the European and North American Bartians he characterized as seeking to justify doing nothing in relation to the struggle for racial justice. The original paper I had in mind for this conference would have noted Bart's observation in the commentary on Romans that it is our pondering over the question, what shall we do, which compels us to undertake so much seemingly idle conversation about God. Bart says it's the pressing practical duties with which the world is filled and the wickedness in the streets and the daily papers that drive us to the Bible and to theology. And the ethical question, he says, is nowhere left out of account in Paul's letter to the Romans. Bart was himself, as we've heard, engaged in the most urgent political issues of his day, Wilhelm II's war policy, the rights of workers in Suffenville, the rise of Nazism, the plight of the Jews, the need to maintain good relations with Germany and Russia after the Second World War, nuclear disarmament, and so on. There seems grounds here for recognizing congruence with the liberationist identification of praxis as the starting and ending point of theology, and other speakers in this conference have identified constructive possibilities for deploying Bart as a resource. But in advance of debates about whether Bart's thought could be a useful resource for liberationist theologies, white theologians in North America, Britain, and elsewhere who work in Bart's studies need to address the question of why, for the most part, Bart's studies has in fact not stimulated or been hospitable to critical reflections on race, whiteness, or liberationist theologies. Cohn's critique 
is that white male theologians take up studying Bart and other white male theologians in place of engaging substantively with race and other pressing social issues that are proximate to their contexts. If he was wrong about that, it could be because we could now demonstrate that Bart Studies is proactively engaging race and other social issues. This conference is a positive sign in that regard. But I think we would all have to agree that Bart Studies generally is not characterized by sustained attention to pressing social questions. Or Cone could be wrong because we reject the connection between studying Bart or other white male theologians and being att inattentive to social issues. Again, while we could cite examples of where studying white male theologians has been a provocation to engage social issues in the main, I think we would have to concede that Cone is right, that there is an unsurprising correlation between choosing white male theological sources and being insufficiently attentive to oppression on grounds such as race that impact on white males the least. If the connection Cone draws between selecting white male sources and being inattentive to pressing social issues is valid, Perhaps we're tempted to accept the connection but reject the critique. We could do so on the grounds that the abstraction of theology from social issues is not necessarily a weakness, that there are very many abstract theological issues that merit academic attention. A search for the articles in the last five years published in the International Journal of Systematic Theology referencing Bart in the title, for example, which all appear to be by white men, treat his doctrine of creation the relationship between his thought and that of Kierkegaard, his doctrine of redemption, and his theology of mission. As theologians, most of us would recognize the interest of such inquiries and would defend the value of such academic work. We appreciate Barth's deliberations about many such abstract questions. But we also recognize that Barth was attentive to the relevance and practical implications of such theological abstractions for the political and social world in which he found himself. Cohn was concerned that Bart's theology neglected history. In The Cross and the Lynching Tree, he argued that Bart's word of God, quote, remains at the level of abstraction, separated from the real crosses in our midst, such as the strange fruit of lynched black bodies, the viewing of which was a Sunday afternoon entertainment for whites. But as we've seen, Cohn was appreciative of the ways Bart addressed pressing social issues of his context and much more critical of the European and North American Bartians who took up abstract themes from Bart's work without attending to pressing social questions such as the oppression of black people. Surely white theologians in Bart's studies must acknowledge the validity of Cohn's critique that to do theology without paying attention to our pressing practical duties and the wickedness in the streets, as Bart put it, is both irresponsible and unbartian. To respond to Cohn's challenge does not, it seems to me, mean that th white theologians may write of race and nothing else. But it seems to me that it requires at least three things of us. First, we must attend to what it means to pursue our work on Barth's doctrine of creation or redemption or mission or his relationship with Kierkegaard or whatever, acutely alert to how our inquiries are informed by racist theological and philosophical traditions that have promoted and enabled white supremacy and the oppression of people of color. If you're not yet convinced of this, uh, I suggest starting with reading J. Cameron Carter's Race, A Theological Account, Emily Townsend's Womanist Ethics and the Cultural Production of Evil, and Willie Jennings's The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race. I suggest it's hard to come away from these books unconvinced that serious theological work is required to unpick the racist foundations upon which we have relied. Second, we must attend to what it means to pursue our work in the social context in which we find ourselves. Bart advised theologians to read both the Bible and the newspapers. We need to do theology alert to the events of our own day and attentive to the filtering lenses of different sources of news, including structurally racist filters that reinforce white normativity and supremacy, and to the ways in which the theology we undertake might bear on the most pressing challenges. This does not mean that everyone must become theological ethicists. There was an ethicist I think we could do more, with more of them. But everyone should be aware of how their work pertains to the most pressing issues that confront us. Key among these questions, as Cohn helped us see, is the continuing force of white supremacy and the racism that means black, Latinx, Asian, and native peoples disproportionately experience. 
We should note that the modern academy does not always encourage or reward the pursuit of academic research in the light of social context, which heightens the need to recognize this as, as uh, important personally and corporately. Third, we must attend in particular to how our theological pursuits intersect with issues of race and whiteness. If we don't realize how our research of Bart's doctrine of creation or redemption or mission or his relationship with Kierkegaard or whatever, how our research and our teaching bear on the question of white privilege and the enduring power of racism, it's very likely that our scholarship and teaching is helping to perpetuate them. One initial remedy is to read authors in our fields who are alert to this linkage and intersection, who are currently most likely to be people of color. In relation to thinking about this in a curricular way, I commend Kingston University's inclusive curriculum framework as one tool to review curricula with this in mind. I'm sure there are other priorities for white scholars uh, in responding to Cohn's critique of white theology and uh, Bartian's Paul suggested some other strategies earlier this morning. In the final part of this paper, I want to provide a worked example of how I'm seeking to work at the intersection of uh, theology of animals, Bart studies, and race and whiteness. One of the most important tasks in my book on animals, volume one, Systematic Theology, was to challenge poorly grounded and ill thought out theological assertions of anthropocentrism within the doctrinal headings of creation, reconciliation, and redemption. Along the way, I developed a strong antipathy to human non-human binaries. I came to see that theological anthropologies alongside others were very apt to be based on the othering of the non-human animal Hannah Reichel described in the form that, quote, unlike any other animal, humans are X or have X or can X. We seem to have inherited from ancient Greek philosophers an irresistible trope for understanding what it means to be human very largely in contradistinction to other animals. I became concerned to interrogate and deconstruct this oppositional understanding of human identity because it seemed to encourage and be supported by bad Christian theology and result in worse Christian ethics in relation to other than human animals. It runs counter to a basic theological understanding of ourselves as creatures of God, a status that affirms human commonality and solidarity with all God's creatures, which means that everything that God has made, everything, uh, which means everything that God has made, everything that exists apart from God's self. Biblical texts recognize humans in common with other animals as fleshy creatures with the breath of life, recipients in common of God's grace in creation and providence, subjects in common of blessing and judgment, participants in common in the praise of God, beneficiaries in common of the work of Christ reconciling all things in heaven and earth, enduring in common the labor pains of a groaning creation and looking forward in common to their liberation into the freedom of the children of God. This theological vision subverts the human separatist logic that motivates our obsession to differentiate ourselves from other animals and justifies our use of them as mere material to exploit for our own ends. Instead, it celebrates our position among God's creatures, part of the magnificently diverse and incomprehensibly immense creaturely order celebrated in Psalm 104 and the closing chapters of Job and encourage, uh, encourages us to seek to enable the flourishing of our fellow creatures and their glorification of God. For a long time, I was naively of the view that while the erection and patrolling of this human non-human barrier fence, and today I can't afford, avoid picturing in my mind the US-Mexican border fence as I say those words, that the, while the erection of that barrier had been negative for non-human animals uh, left beyond it, it had been positive for many humans on the basis that the recognition that all humans were entitled to the recognition of basic rights was a moral advance. I had in mind a magical circle encompassing and offering protection to all humans. 
I was concerned for the non-humans left outside, but did not want to improve their lot at the cost of humans losing rights to protections, as Peter Singer's preference utilitarian theory explicitly does in relation, say, to newborn infants. But then I read Giorgio Gambon's The Open and his story of the anthropological machines that divide human and inhuman, or, quote, man and animal but inevitably produce a zone of indeterminacy which resulted in Jews being classified as non-man and vulnerable to extermination in death camps. And then I read J. Cameron Carter's Race of Theological Account where he unmasks Kant's typology of human races, where the American people, by which he means Native Americans, are judged incapable of education, the Negro race only capable of being educated as servants, the Hindus capable of training in the arts but not the sciences, all to be stamped out by the race of whites that uniquely contains within itself all motivations and talents. Carter demonstrates that Kant's moral universalism, the foundation of so much progressive moral philosophy and theological ethics, is the universalizing of whiteness, a project of eradicating inferior humans in favor of his fellow whites. In other work, Carter critiques a Gamben and notes the need to extend our understanding of the anthropological machine to recognize, quote, how the Jews were pushed towards a blackened, indeed a colonialized position, shall we say, closer to the slave and therefore closer to killable flesh. And then I read uh, Willie's, Willie Jennings's The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, in which he recounts key episodes from Christianity's colonial history, illuminating the way in which white colonizers saw themselves as co-creators with God of the new world, and that whiteness and the racial oppression it enabled was central among their creations. Most striking for me from Jennings's analysis is his critique of the Anglican Bishop John William Colenso's 19th century theology arising from his experience of colonial South Africa. Concerned to find a place for the evident faith of his black South African theological conversation partners, uh, William Nagidi and Magema Magwaza uh, Fuse, Colenso proposed that God has simply provided a righteousness to the whole human race in Jesus Christ. Despite his good intentions, this theological move, Jennings argues, repeated by many later Christian theologians, among which we might number Bart, turns away from and refuses to recognize the South African cultural logic Colenso encountered and results in, quote, a universalism that undermines all forms of identity except that of the colonialist. After reading Agamben, Carter, and Jennings, I've abandoned my previous naive belief that establishing and patrolling the human-non-human barrier fence is positive for humans. Instead, it looks to me that the creating and policing of this border is bad for vulnerable humans and disproportionately for those not racialized as white, whose humanity may be placed in question by the existence of the barrier as well as bad for the non-human animals it keeps outside our moral concern. Here is one of the many sites of convergence I've encountered where critical attention to race and to animals in a theological context turns out not to be in competition or contradiction, but as complementary critiques of the same structural issue. The key reason critical perspectives on race and animals are often complementary is that whiteness as a human universal ideal is constructed in opposition both to humans racialized as not white and animals identified as non-human, and the uh, important common ground with uh, Hannah's analysis here. The intersection with feminist animal studies, such as in the work of Carol Adams, adds gender to the mix, unmasking the depiction of a normative white male humanity in contradistinction from black, brown, and female humans and non-human animals. And of course, the intersectionality multiplies as we attend to Latin American liberation theologies attending to socioeconomic status and political power, queer theologies challenging normative sexualities, disability theologies challenging ableist norms. This intersection between theology, race, and animals has implications for our interpretations of Barth's theology. In On Animals, Volume 1, I critiqued the radical anthropocentricity of Barth's account of creation as the external basis of a covenant between God and humanity. The idea that the whole of creation other than the human was brought into being to enable God's relationship to, with humanity runs counter to much of the theology of creation and redemption in the Bible and is profoundly problematic for Christian animal ethics. 
As a remedy, I explored the path Bart identified but did not take in the preface of volume 3.2 of the dogmatics, that, quote, the limits of the term creature may, with the necessary boldness and sobriety, be more widely drawn than I have dared attempt. In the light of the critiques of Agamben, Carter, and Jennings, however, Bart's focus on the universal human as the object of God's covenant looks problematic for humans not racialized as white as well as for non-human animals. This strengthens the argument I made in On Animals, Volume 1, that we need to think beyond Bart in conceiving of God's gracious covenant, creation covenant as embracing all creatures. But the critiques of Cohn, Carter, and Jennings of the association between whiteness and universalism made clear that in this extension, we must be committed to the theological work of engaging the particularities of the lives of creatures that God creates, reconciles, and redeems, and the intersections between creaturely lives. For example, we need to attend carefully in a theological context to what it means that pigs in North Carolina are raised in huge industrialized facilities. Not only in North Carolina, of course, but let's be particular. There are about nine million pigs in North Carolina, which is roughly equal to the human population. Although, um, because of where those facilities are located, the pigs often outnumber uh, the population of humans in particular counties. Research has shown that when pigs uh, bred for intensive uh, production are liberated from these facilities and given access to parkland, they adopt complex patterns of social life, use of territory and nest building, uh, similar to those of uh, wild boar. They develop particular friendships, uh, sows uh, uh, build particular nests, they're very careful about where they defecate uh, uh, and so on. And they spend, almost, uh, they spend a large proportion of their time rooting in the earth, uh, so we can judge that to be one of their favorite activities. Modern industrial systems give pigs no opportunity to flourish in these ways as creatures of God. They're raised in monotonous indoor environments in which their tails have to be cut off to reduce the incidence of biting injuries. Sows are so closely confined that they cannot turn around, and they never get to engage in rooting in the earth. Treating pigs in this way also has uh, implications for other creatures. The pig factories create huge lagoons of excrement, the contents of which are sprayed into the air on nearby fields to stop the lagoons overflowing, creating nauseating odors, noxious gases, swarms of flies, and then noisy trucks come and go at all hours to remove the dead pigs that cannot tolerate these conditions. One campaigner comments that the poor, quote, literally get shit on. No one in North Carolina wants to live next to these facilities, which means they get sighted next to communities where poor black Latinx and native peoples live. Their children are teased at school because they smell of pig shit. This is environmental racism, and North Carolinan protesters against the pig farms have been called N-word loving. So the protests against the pig farms have been criticized as N-word loving. Last Thursday, lawmakers in Raleigh implemented Senate Bill 711 to stop neighbors complaining and restricting the damages that could be awarded against the operators of these facilities. The meat processing plants where the pigs are slaughtered and butchered employs laborers, laborers that are disproportionately female, migrant, black, and Latinx, subjecting them to work that is dangerous for their physical and mental health. The unhealthy subsidized products of industrialized animal agriculture are often the only affordable foods in urban food deserts where disproportionate numbers of poor black and Latinx people live. And on the macro scale, raising livestock is a major and neglected contributor to climate change, among the first victims of which are Pacific Islanders and other humans living in marginal contexts, as well as many communities of non-human animals and plants. A Bartian framework 
in which God enacts a radically gracious creaturely covenant through the life and death of Jesus Christ, the fleshy word of God, provides a critical lens to recognize the egregious wrong done to humans and other animals in such systems, and the need for theologians to challenge, challenge them. But only if theologians enter into the messy, in this case very messy, particular concrete features of what it means to be this black or brown or white human or this pink or any other color of non-human creature. In response to Cone, we need theologians prepared to get their hands dirty and do their theology with attention to the historical circumstances of particular human and non-human creaturely lives. Doing theology in dialogue with Bart, alert to the contribution theology can make to interpreting and challenging contexts of creaturely oppression, including racialized oppression, would be a significant response Bartian scholarship could make to Cohn's critique. In conclusion, I've argued in this paper that most white scholars of Bart, including me, have reason to be red-faced when confronting the uncomfortable truth that 50 years have passed since James Cone wrote Black Theology and Black Power, crit crit critiquing the un-Bartian ways Bart was being appropriated in Europe and North America. In that half century during which Cone developed and refined his critique, white Bart scholars have almost completely ignored it. And as a result, we find that Cohn's strong and persuasive critique of Bartian theological studies remains valid 50 years on. Without overestimating the influence of Bart's studies, this culpable inattention must be understood as part of the complex in which the President of the United States can order the seizing and caging of immigrant children, and much more directly contributes to educational cultures where the hashtag seminary while black is needed. If our theology is to be in good faith, it seems to me that we need to attend to Cone's worry, that it seems easier for European and North American theologians to engage with Latin American liberation theologies in solidarity with the poor far away than it is for them to address the challenge of racial, racially, disadvantaged people near, uh, racially disadvantaged near neighbors at home. After recognizing the culpable neglect of Cohn's critique of Bartians, I've argued that white scholars in Bart studies need first to become alert to the ways in which the theological traditions passed on to us are shaped by racist colonial attitudes. Second, to attend to the theological work demanded by the wickedness in the streets and the practical duties that press upon us. And third, be attentive to the intersections of our particular theological passions and critical liberationist perspectives, including those faced, focused on race and whiteness an example of which I gave in relation to the wide creaturely impacts of industrial pig farming in North Carolina. A necessary step in undertaking these tasks will be learning not only from Cone's corpus, but also from the broad and diverse literature engaging and going beyond Cone at the interface between theology and race, most, much of it in black womanist, Latinx, African and Asian theologies. All scholars of Bart have reason to value and celebrate these contributions and to encourage and foster a continuing widening of the diversity of theological scholarship on Bart and within theology as a whole. Practically and immediately, I suggest that faculty who do not yet engage these perspectives and critiques in their courses on Bart and other white male figures should do so, that doctoral proposals that show no awareness of these challenges to, white to the white theological status quo be judged inadequate, and that scholarship sent for a peer review that's inattentive to these concerns be returned for revision. These are not new or original suggestions, are already in place in other theological contexts, and need to be supplemented by many others in order to affect the change of scholarly culture that is now required. But I think them worth stating because they're not yet common in all Bart studies. Only through such conscious, deliberate, and practical action, it seems to me, could we be confident that any Bart scholars meeting 50 years from now will be in a different position to the embarrassing one in which we find ourselves today.